Good evening, good evening, good evening, and Happy New Year. Happy 2022. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. I pray that your new year, 2022, is off to a splashing start and that you're having just a wonderful time so far. I mean, it's only been two, three days, so got to be having fun by now, right? Anyway, it's good to be with you this evening. God bless you. It's good to be with you in this new year. And uh, let me get started. I'll pray. Lord, we thank you, Heavenly Father. We bless and magnify your name. We are so grateful and excited to be alive and well in 2022. Thank you for your blessings, your mercy, your grace, your love. We thank you for all that you've provided thus far. And we thank you for the hope that you will continue to lead us and protect us and provide for us into the future as long as you have us to be here. We pray that you would bless all that we do in this year. Bless the works of our hands. Let's bless the words that we speak. Let us be kind and gentle. Let us be your hand extended. Lord God, bless us as we look for bright things in this new year. As we look into the session this evening, we pray that your name would be glorified and that your kingdom will be exalted in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. Good to be with you this evening. Thank you so much for joining me. Our topic this evening is sound the alarm. Sound the alarm. When we think of an alarm, we usually think of, um, we, we pay attention and try and figure out, okay, what is this alarm all about? What is going on? What's the emergency? And we think of the alarm and we want to know what is the nature of the problem? Okay, what's the problem? Why is this alarm going on? What is the issue? How serious is the matter at hand? How, how serious is it? What type of alarm is it? Is it an alarm just to wake us up at some point during the day? Just an alarm to wake us up? Or is it an alarm that warns that there's a possible fire in the house? Which, which type of alarm is it? Is it the type of alarm that goes off when the when your toddler starts to move his fire truck across the floor, you hear an alarm, woo, 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 you hear that alarm. Or is it the alarm that tells you that three or four fire trucks are coming through your neighborhood? You live in a cul-de-sac, so that means that the fire is about two or three houses down from you. Is the alarm, is it a three fire alarm? Is that the type of alarm that you're getting? But it doesn't matter what type of alarm it is. An alarm calls us to attention. It causes us to pay attention, look around, see what's going on. At least because you hear it, you just look around. We respond differently, though, based on what the alarm is. But we can all agree that the alarm, alarms are a great benefit to us in our lives. When we hear an alarm, it gives us an alert. It warns us. It helps us to get prepared. And it keeps us in line. It warns us that an appointed time has come, if it's an alarm for um, to wake us up or something, and we get to understand what the alarm is all about. They keep us in line. They keep us focused. They let us know whether we're in a danger zone, approaching a, a danger zone, or we're safe, or we need to do something, change something, move, get out of the way. An alarm, a car horn is an alarm. So we think of alarms and different alarms mean different things. Based on the alarm, we know the level of danger or what needs to be done in this moment or needs to wait until later. The word of God is clear concerning warnings and alarms. The spiritual, our spiritual zone, the spiritual danger zone, we get warnings to tell us, don't go this way. The word of God directs us to help us to stay out of spiritual danger zones. It gives us warnings. And as well as they warn others, we warn us as to how to help others. They warn us that to keep our lives in check, or they warn us on how to deal with the lives of others that we influence. And Jehovah is holding us responsible and accountable for the lost souls that he, that pass our way, that comes through our life, that we interact with day by day by day. And sometimes we as Christians, we feel like once I straight, once my family straight, I find but Jehovah hasn't delivered us for us to live that way. He saved us to reach others. And the people we come in contact day by day, we need to sound the alarm for them and let them know where the dangers are as it, as it relates to eternity. Their lives, their, it's their souls and eternity. We need to sound the alarm. Are we warning them of the dangers of losing their soul? 
or the danger of being rejected by Jehovah? Are we warning them about these things? Or are we just concerned about ourselves? Do we warn them about the fact that to die without Christ is damnation? Are we warning anybody? And we may say, yeah, yeah, nobody want to hear about no hellfire damnation. Nobody want to hear about that. But Jehovah compels us to warn them. He compels us to warn them. Whether they pay heed, take heed or not, that's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to warn them. Ezekiel 3, 18 to 21 says, When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked ways to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will, will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked ways, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. So Jehovah is saying here, now, I previously referred to alarms, different alarms alarming us about different things and the level of urgency that they present. Alarms in this, the alarm in this scripture is like a three fire alarm. This is really, really serious. This is like having multiple trucks on your block trying to out a three fire alarm. That means three, four, five different fire trucks have to come to out this fight. This is a very serious matter. This warning is a very serious matter. So this is a three fire alarm very serious this is very serious why because your house is now in danger when we're dealing with the fire your house is now in danger you could you could worry about the, the, the neighbor's house or the house down the street but the closer it get to your house the more of a danger it is to you personally and what is this saying Jehovah is saying to us what the, the scripture is saying that our, it is our responsibility to warn the wicked it is our responsibility to warn those unsafe, unsaved persons, the ones on our jobs, the one in our churches, the ones in our homes, the ones on the street, our friends, everybody. It is our duty to warn them. It is our duty to warn them. What's good, though, is that a warning can be gentle. Sometimes we feel like when we witness the people, we always have to be brash and bold and forceful and pushy. It doesn't always have to be that way. We don't always have to be pushy. An alarm, a warning can be gentle, like the alarm that wakes you up um, to get up. Sometimes um, with your phone, you have these different levels. One minute, it's really gentle. Then it gets more loud and louder and louder as you make up your mind to turn it off. But some alarms can be gentle. Sometimes we talk to people about Jesus Christ. We don't have to be brash and rude and and shouting and you know condemning we don't always have to be that way we can be quite gentle and get the message across about the love of god we can do that in a gentle way we don't have to offend people all the time when we try to warn them warnings can be gentle there can be gentle a warn gentle alarms gentle warnings i remember um jehovah prompted me to witness to a family member um, sometime several years ago and I was hesitant I didn't want because you know you don't want to be bothering people and they have their life to live and you go into heaven they decide to go somewhere else that's their business but Jehovah prompted me to witness to a family member so I was like okay 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 and I was like I really don't I'm feeling this but I said okay if you want me to do it give me the words tell me what to say and I prayed and Jehovah gave me the words and after I was done speaking to the person, they said to me, you know, I know God sent you to me. I was like, what? They say, yeah, I know God sent you to me because there's so much going on in my life and I really need to make some changes. So here I was afraid to speak to this person and this person is now saying to me, you know, I'm really glad you talked to me because I really need to think about what you've said. I didn't have to scream. I didn't have to shout. I didn't have to pull out no Bible and nothing like that. All I had to do was witness and say what Jehovah has done in my life. And, you know, it really made an impression. Did she get, um, did she accept Christ right there on the spot? No. Jehovah didn't tell me to go there and make her accept him. He said, go and share your witness, share your testimony with her. So I did, and that was the end of it. Like I said, she didn't say to me, okay, pray the sin of prayer with me, but that was not what Jehovah sent me there to do. He 
he told me to share my testimony, gave me the words to share. And I shared my testimony with her. And that's all that he asked me to do. And sometimes that is all that he will ask us to do. Just simply lift me up, lift him up. Um, as John 12, 32 says, John, the book of John chapter 12, verse 32 says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So all Jehovah is asking us to do is to lift him up, exalt him, you know, testify about him, talk about his goodness, tell people the change he's made in our lives. We might suck our teeth and say, ain't nobody into church. Nobody into, nobody want to hear nothing about the Bible and Jesus and God. And, you know, nobody want to hear that. You say people are enjoying their lives and they don't want to hear all that. And over the many years, Christian have been, Christians have been led to le believe that we must beat people over the head with the word of God and make them come to Jesus Christ. Beat them with the gospel. Argue and debate about the power of God and we must carry on this way with people all the time. But we do, we do not see that played out in Scripture. Scripture does not support that. Scripture does not support that. Jesus did no such thing. Jesus never beat people up to accept him. He simply presented himself to them as the Lamb of God, the way, the truth, and the life. He said he was the Son of God, the light of the world, the I am that I am. He, did, he said all that, and then he left the decision to them. You make your decision. I've told you what the truth is. I've presented you with the truth. Now you make a decision. Jehovah never forces us to do anything. He always gives us, he's given us free will, and he never forces us to take it back from us. You may say, wow, that was easy to do. It was easy to testify and witness and, you know, do what Jehovah told you to do. That was simple. That was easy. Uh, yes, that was easy. It was easy to do that. You see, it's easy to witness about Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. It's easy to do that. But it's quite different to be a witness for Jesus Christ. We can witness about what Jesus Christ has done in our lives, but it's, and that's easy. Because it's easy for you to tell your story. It's easy for you to say, oh, I used to be this. I was lost and now I'm found. I used to be a drug addict and Jehovah cleaned me up and now I'm standing on my feet and living for him. That's easy to do because you experience that. You could talk about that all day. We could talk about that all day. But it's different to be a witness for Jesus Christ. What do I mean by that? And like I say, you can easily talk. Talking, talking, talking. You can do all that. You can do that all day. What people want to see is how that experience with Jesus Christ has changed your life. How do, how do you act now? How do you act differently? How has it changed your life, changed your action, changed your behavior? See, because if there's a lot of talk and no change in your behavior and nothing about you that draws people to Christ, then, like people say, mouth make to say anything, you could talk. Talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. They want to see some evidence evidence of how Christ has changed your life how you used to be rowdy and boisterous and carrying on and now you are kind of gentler person because you don't let everything get under your skin anymore you're able to handle things with temperance and gentleness and meekness and that is where the challenge comes in being a witness for Jesus Christ it's easy to talk and talk about your experience but when it comes around to being that witness being that witness for Jesus Christ that's a totally different story because that's what the world wants to see they want to see that light and that change in our lives and that's what draws them to him he said if he be lifted up he will draw all men we lift him up by our lifestyle and our actions so most of our efforts should be in growing to be more and more into the image of Jesus Christ more and more like him when we become more and more like him his light starts to shine through us the joy the love the peace of God can clearly be seen in us when we lift Jesus up when we are the light of God when the light of God is shining through us it is easy to draw people to him and when we are living that lifestyle and, and we are, there's a difference and a change in us and we don't act like the world and respond to situations and circumstances like the world, when we don't respond that way, people are drawn to us. It wouldn't be so hard to witness because sometimes people will come to us and say, wow, I see a change in you. Or can you tell me why you respond to life this way? 
you don't worry the way normal people do you don't stress you don't certain things you just don't do you just live you're so calm and so peaceful and then they're already open to the gospel because of the light they see shining in your life it makes them more susceptible more open now you don't have to beat down the door and try to beat them up to get them to listen to the gospel. They are now coming to you in many cases. People will come to you and ask, wow, how do how, how you cope with these kind of things? How do you cope with this situation? And they'll see the light of God in you and they'll work. They'll, they'll be drawn to you and Jehovah will be able to work through you to draw them. Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. They will see the good works and glorified Father. You lift him up. He's exalted and he does the drawing. The world will draw to the light of Jesus Christ that shines through us. So most of our energy and focus should be on making sure that that light is shining bright. That's where most of our efforts should be. Not in the talking and the bragging and all that stuff. Be busy trying to make sure that your light is shining. The light of Jesus Christ is shining through us. Once our light is shining bright, a gentle, kind word and the Holy Spirit, as he prompts us, a gentle, kind word will be all that is needed for conviction and repentance. For people to come to us and say, I'm ready to give my life to Christ. Oh, I see in the way you live, I want Jesus to change my life. I heard your testimony, but I really realized that, yes, there has been a change in you, and I'm drawn to that change, and I want that change for my life. So most of our work should be in getting our lives in order, because we can't be a testimony for nobody. We can't be a testimony for Jesus Christ if our lives are still in shambles, if we still fly off the handle at every little thing. There's no peace of God in us, so nobody's drawn to that. They could get that in the world. Their lives are probably already like that, so they're not impressed. So we need to put most of our effort into making, letting that light of Jesus Christ shine through us. We don't have to badger people and beat them up. It'll be less of that we'll have to do. We won't have that much work to do. And sometimes in the past, we have gotten into this combative situation where we're constantly fussing with people over whether the Bible is real and whether Jesus is real and we start to witness the people and they just start going off about how this one is a Christian and they crook it in the next thing and they just go off the handle on things like that very easily. But you don't get caught into that kind of stuff. If you start to witness to somebody and they're combative, leave them alone and let them settle. Let them say whatever they have to say and be done with it and move on. Jesus didn't call us to fight. The word of God is the sword. We speak the word of God and let him do the rest after that. And we found that in churches and in Christians, some Christians and many of us when we were young Christians, we, are, we, we feel like the Lord has called us to save the whole world. In our passion and our zeal and our you know excitement about Jesus Christ and winning the loss and bringing them to Christ, sometimes we, do, we did more harm than good. We really did more harm than good because of our bold, brash attitude. We did more harm than good. Most of us, many of us. This happened often in churches and Christian ministries. Sometimes it's done in innocence and ignorance. Sometimes we just don't know no better. We just feel like Jesus sent us to win the world. So we go out there and we start beating people up with the Bible. We are excited, we are on fire for the Lord, and we feel that Jehovah has called us to save the world. And we think that our shouting and condemnation causes people to come to Jesus Christ. But sadly, sometimes it drives people away. So we do, we do want to win the loss, but we have to make sure our temperament is correct. Make sure we're doing it the way Jesus would have done it. Although Jehovah called us to sound the alarm, we must follow the example that, of Jesus Christ. Jesus never condemned sinners. They were already feeling bad. Remember the woman who came, they was about to stone her. She was already feeling bad. So Jesus didn't condemn her. But he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So Jesus really didn't spend much time beating up on sinners and trying to get them to, you know, stop and repent and row and row. He was not fussy like that. He did tell them that they need to repent and receive him for salvation. That point was clear. I am the Son of God, 
and through me you can get into the kingdom and all that that that's part of it was clear but he never berated them or beat them up about it he was never judgmental he was never cruel not to sinners but the people that jesus really dealt with harshly was the church leaders the pharisees and the sadducees and all of those in the big robes and the big hat yeah jesus jesus brought the pain for them they got it why because the, they claim to know the truth they claim to know the truth they claim to know the way they claim that abraham they were abraham's seeds and jehovah's chosen people and his chosen race so they knew what the law said but were they doing it no they were far from it they knew better than the evil they were practicing they knew better than the evil they were practicing Jesus didn't play with them. John the Baptist definitely didn't play with them. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 4 to 7, it says, And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea, all the regions round about Jordan. And when the Baptist when and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So John just picked up the sword and start slinging. John just start dealing with them suddenly. You vipers, you know, vipers are snakes. You generation of snakes. So John wasn't playing with them. John was taking no prisoners. He took every opportunity to sound the alarm and let them know. Y'all need to get your act together. You are wicked. And John constantly told them to turn from their wicked ways. And John was making sure that his hands was clean. No blood was to be required at his hand. There was nothing. He knew that once he had warned them and continued for, to fulfill his purpose, See, John was fulfilling, busy fulfilling his purpose, but then he was also able to warn them and to warn the sinners and have them come and be baptized, telling them, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So John constantly reminded them that they needed to repent. But when the Sadducees and the Pharisees showed up, they were busy trying to tear up John's ministry. John told them, you all are a pack of snakes. Go find some, because you all, you all talking about being Abraham, see, but you all ain't acting. You're only acting like God's chosen people. And John continued to fulfill his purpose in the earth. His purpose was to pave the way for the Messiah. Prepare the way for Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He was making sure his job was being done. Both John and Jesus sent strong warnings to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, letting them know that the long white robes and the religious rituals that they went through, they were, they was they was practicing and it was not impressing God. Jehovah was not impressed with them. They was not they were not going to be exempt from judgment. They were not going to be exempt from the judgment of God. They could not use those cover ups and all that to make to cover up their sinful ways. Whatever sins they were doing were in full view of Jehovah. The robes wasn't covering it up. The bunch of talking and speaking and, and bowing and all that, that was not covering up the sins that they were committing. And they were committing sins knowing that they were wrong, but they were doing it anyway. They were warned that their evil acts were in plain sight of Jehovah. Nothing was hidden from him. And he would judge them for each evil act. They were going to be judged by Jehovah. That's why Jesus sounded the alarm on them and so did John because they knew better. So while they were continually attempting to call down fire and brimstone upon the poor lost souls, the people that were just coming around to hear Jesus preach and trying to live a good life, a good, holy, righteous life, they trying their best and struggling. Now the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees come around to judge them and condemn them. And just how I said, sometimes we just beat people over the head with the gospel instead of just living a life out before them and allowing them to see Jesus in us and to be drawn to the kingdom. John and Jesus made them know, let them know plainly that while they were busy dipping and dabbling in sin, the people that they were condemning would probably make it into the kingdom of God before them. 
Jesus told them straight up in Matthew 5, verse 20. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, Jesus said, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is like, you know, if, if, if the Pharisees and Sadducees are your role models, you might not make it into the kingdom of God. Who is Jesus speaking to? He's speaking to the multitudes that always came to hear him when he was speaking. They came, they followed him all over Judea to hear him preach the word of God. What was he saying to them? Do better than these hypocrites you see here. Do you sit in a long robe and everything? Be better than them because you cannot use them as role models. They are simply carrying out great performances. They carry look good on the outside because they do not have genuine righteousness. And if you follow behind them and try to get your righteousness to look like theirs, that's not real righteousness. That's fake. That's phony. That's a performance. Do not look at them. Do not make them your role model for godliness because their level of godliness will not get you into the kingdom of heaven. It will not get you in. What he said? Ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven if your righteousness is like theirs. You shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. The scribes and the Pharisees were deceived into thinking that they could put on a good show. If they could put on a good show, they could secure their salvation and that would get them into the kingdom of God. All they have to do is put on a good show, put on the long robe and, and bow and do all the attendance and roll call. And once they do all of that, they would enter. The, but it, they were deceived because that's not what is required. They would, they just like many of us today as Christians, we're depending on church membership, length of service to a particular church or denomination, sacrificial offerings, good works and kindness and generosity. We were, we're dependent on all those to give us brownie points with God. They'll give us, if we do all this, we get brownie points with God and he'll give us status in the kingdom of God. But none of these things will impress Jehovah. None of it impresses Jehovah. That's why he said, your righteousness ain't exceed, will not, does not exceed the, the scribes and the Pharisees, then your righteousness is vain. So many, many people, both sinners and saints, will be shocked to find out who will be there on that day. Who will be standing there and who will hear the words, come ye blessed of my father, and who will hear, depart from me, I know you not. Be shocked to find out who's going to hear the part from me. Some of the people who serve in church for the longest period of time. But Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew you. They say, I prophesy in your name. Really? We need to sound the alarm. People are deceived into thinking that, you know, their works are going to get them. Status in the kingdom of God and it's not going to work. What a sad day it will be and what a happy day it will be. Many who have hardly ever darkened a church door will hear, enter, welcome into the kingdom of God. Some who had not hardly gone to church and some who've been in church all their life will hear, depart from me. The Apostle Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27, he said, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. After I spent all my life preaching to people, Jehovah look at me and say, depart from me. The devil, no. Be righteous. Don't act righteous. Be righteous. Imagine the tears, the wailing, the regret, the anguish. Imagine having served faithfully for so many years only to find out that the works were all done with the wrong motive. To impress people, to impress a leader, to be seen of the people as great and wonderful, if that's the reason why you're doing it and not for the kingdom to be exalted, then you must hear the alarm. The alarm is going off. The alarm is going off. Get your house in order. Remember that while we must be busy winning the loss, the warning, the alarm must be sounded also for the saints. 
You're wanting the sinners, but you're wanting the saints as well. The saints must be one. The people who claim to know Jehovah, those who claim to have a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. An urgent warning must be sounded for Christians as well, who are secretly practicing evil. Because unlike sinners, who are ignorant as to what Jehovah law, Jehovah's law says, they sinners, they don't know much. They know a couple of scriptures of the Bible that they were quoting from a child. But some of us as Christians, we've been in the church hearing the warning over and over and over again. We know what the law of God says. We know what is acceptable to God and we know what he's not going to stand for. But what do we do? Play games and play like we're going to get in anyway. We will have no excuse. What will we say? What will we say to him? After we have bragged that we have read the Bible cover to cover, I've read the Bible through 20 times, 30 times. I've read the Bible through for 15 years, 16 years, 20 years. Every year I read through the Bible. All that Bible you read, all that scripture you memorized, just to hear Jehovah say, depart from me. We have to serve the Lord with sincere hearts. Some of us have been serving the Lord since we were teenagers. What will we say? How can we face Jesus? He gave his life. He made the ultimate sacrifice. He paid the penalty for our sins. But instead of confessing our sins and repenting and turning from our wicked ways, like the Bible says, what we did? What did we do? We decided to play religious games. Play religious games. This is one of the reasons why sinners have no interest in the gospel and sometimes. Sometimes sinners don't want nothing to do with the Bible, with church, with church Christian people, because they see too many, like um, John said, hypocrites. Too many hypocrites. No interest. They have no interest in giving their lives to Jesus. They've seen too many and too much of us. They see Jesus. They see us. All they could see is us, our flesh, our actions, our attitudes, our, our bad ways. They've seen too much of us. There's an old Pentecostal song that says, Get right with God and do it now. Get right with God and do it now. Why? Why now? Well, now is the only time that we have. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know if we'll see tomorrow. Now is the only time we have. It says, Get right with God and do it now. Stop playing the game. Stop joking around. Get right with God. We need to sound the alarm. So as that alarm goes off and it's time to get up, we need to sound the alarm so the Christians can wake up. So the sinners can realize Jesus is coming. And he's not taking anything that doesn't belong, with, belong to him. Joel chapter 2 verse 1 says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. The day of the Lord cometh, it's nigh at hand. Jesus is coming. The question is, is he coming for you? Is he coming for me? Why? Because he's not a thief. Jesus is not a thief. He's not taking anyone that does not belong to him. If you belong to him, he's coming for you. If you don't belong to him, he's not coming for you. If we are sensitive to the Spirit of God, we can feel the urgency. We can feel the urgency in the air as to this must be done and it must be done now. We got to get busy doing the work of the kingdom. Time is running out. We can almost hear the alarm going off. You could almost hear it. It's just an urgency. If you're sensitive to the Spirit of God, you can feel the urgency. And anyone that is sensitive to the Spirit of God knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's like the horn in the police cars. We, the police cars have this horn, this god-awful sound in this horn. And you just wanted to hurry up, shut up, stop making noise with that horn. But they, they blow it hard so you can get out the road and get out their way. But it's an awful sound that the police horn makes. And it's just, it's supposed to be annoying. It's supposed to get you to pay attention. And that's the kind of sound that we as Christians must be making. We must be telling people everywhere we go, everywhere we go, tell Jesus is coming. 
it's time to get our lives in order, get our houses in order. Talking to our Christian friends, if we're going to be Christians, let's be Christians. If we're going to be children of God, people of God, let's be people of God. We can feel the urgency. We can hear the almost hear the alarm going off. We cannot mistake. You cannot. The sound is so irritating, and you can feel it so much in your spirit. You cannot mistake it for anything else. Just as you cannot mistake that police car horn for anything else. That god awful sound. You're like, oh, that's the police sound. That's the police car. That's the horn in the police car. It's awful. And we want them to hurry up and stop making noise or hurry up, drive down the street and stop making noise with that alarm. And that's what the sinners in the world would say to us. Stop talking about Jesus. Nobody want to hear nothing about Jesus. Put their hands over their ears and stop their ears. Just stop talking to me about Jesus. Why? Because they want to remain in their sin and they don't want no conviction. Nobody talk to me about Jesus because I don't want to be convicted. But when they stand before God, they will remember quite clearly when they insisted that you stop, that you shut up, leave me alone. I don't want to hear nothing about that. And they'll remember that day. But what will Jehovah say to you? Remember the first scripture I read? That blood will not be, be required at their hand because you did sound the, award, the alarm. You did sound the warning. They avoid church so they don't have to deal with the word of God. That's just what's happening. And because they did not want to be seen, they didn't want you to see the evil. They avoid friends that are Christian. Don't want to be around you. Why? Your light. Remember the light I talked about? Let your light so shine. The light of your light, the light of your life shines upon the evil and causes it to be seen. As ambassadors of the kingdom of God, we cannot allow anything to hinder our witness. Remember I said, we can we have to be witnesses. We can't just be talkers. We can't just be witnessing for Jehovah. We have to be, we have to be witnesses for him. We can't just um, be talking and talking and talking about it and then there's no evidence in our lives. We have to be witnesses. Not just witness, but be witnesses for Jehovah. We must strive with all that is, is within us to be those lights shining in this dark world. We have to pay attention to our light. We can witness and we must witness. We must sound the alarm. We must tell lost men and women that, look, Jesus is coming. Time is running out. We continually say that. And remember I said, be kind, be gentle. And those that walk up to you and ask you, what's going on with you? Well, how come your life is like, be ready to give your testimony. Be ready to tell them about the goodness of God and what he has done in your life. If we refuse to sound the alarm, we do so at the risk of people all around us losing their souls. We never say anything to them, so they continue to live the way they were living and go off into eternity without Jesus Christ. Sad will be the cry. We must sound the alarm. We must continue to talk about this goodness of God, but most of all, put most of our energies into doing what? Being a light. Living the life before people, showing the goodness of God in our kindness and the way we respond to people. And you can imagine somebody come to witness to you and all they're doing is rowing and shouting and beating you up with a Bible. No. Just share the gospel kindly, gently. And they respond better. The old people used to say people respond better to sugar than to salt. Let's use the sugar of the word of God and continue to allow people to come and draw near to the light of Christ that is within us. We must be kind. We can be gentle. But we cannot be silent. We can be kind in our witness. We can be gentle in our witness. But we cannot be silent. We must open our mouths and sound the alarm. God bless you, bless you. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. I pray that something I said resonated with you and that you were able to glean some further knowledge of the things of God this evening. Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate you joining me. Let me pray and close. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Thank you, Father, for helping us to strengthen our witness. Lord, because you said 
If you be lifted up, you will draw all men unto you. So, Father, help us that through our testimony, through our lifestyle, through our life living, through our response to circumstances and situations in life, cause our lights to shine bright, that mankind would be drawn to you in this dark world, Lord God. The light will shine and mankind will be drawn to you and into your kingdom. Lord, help us to continue to sound the alarm. Continue to witness the people, witness the friends, relatives. Just let them know about the goodness of the Lord. And Lord, we pray that our lives would bear the witness more than our words, far more than our words. Our lives would be a testimony for you. Bless us now, we pray, as we go to bed tonight. We pray that you will grant us sweet sleep. Keep us by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, bless you. Thank you once again. Thank you for joining me. It was a pleasure to be with you. And like I always say, you could have been doing anything else, but you decided to spend these moments with me. Thank you ever so much. And may Jehovah continually bless your life. Goodbye.